Hello everybody and welcome to Seawater Part 2. So thank you so much for sticking with me through these lectures. I know it's not easy to do this at home, but I really, really appreciate you guys sticking with me. So um, thank you also because I'm recording some of these videos out of order. So some of the videos I've actually already recorded um, and now I'm trying to piece them back together for the semester. So bear with me if these things sound a little jarbled or jumbled or, you know, I'm saying things that don't pertain to your class. I probably just recorded that video a while ago and I'm reusing it, sorry, but this is hard <laughs> and it takes a lot of time to actually record these videos. So I do appreciate you guys sticking with me and, um, and just un understanding that I'm doing the best that I can to try to get you all the information that I would have been able to deliver in person, but at home. Um, so it is up on YouTube. I usually try to post things a couple days in advance, if not a week in advance. So if you want to just breeze through some, all, some or all of the videos that are up there, just go ahead. Um, like I said, some of the videos I've already recorded, like especially the end of the semester stuff, I did record um, at the end of the fall spring semester when all this started happening. So um, yes, I am reusing those videos, but it's because these take a bit, these take a long time to make and um, edit and then upload and all that kind of stuff. So. Thank you guys for sticking with me. I know it's not hard. It's not easy for anybody, including myself. Um, lecturing to my kitchen is just not nearly as much fun as it is lecturing to you guys. So with that said, let's move on to seawater part two. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today. So let me get my clicker. Okay, now we're ready. Um, all right, seawater. So you're like, what are you talking about? We've already talked everything about seawater that I could possibly need to know about seawater and you would be wrong because there's so much more about seawater that we need to learn. So that's what we're going to be learning about today. Now, this particular diagram, let me see if I can fix this image. There we go. Okay. Um, this image is going to come up a couple times in the semester, so I would recommend that you guys study it now and just kind of pay attention and learn all of these things now because then you don't have to worry about learning them later. So this is the ocean right here. Obviously, the blue stuff, the brown stuff is land. Weird. Okay, so... Usually what we have is this open ocean part. This is like far away from land. So we're not near any continents, right? We're just in the middle of the ocean where it's very flat. Maybe you get some sub, you know, um, submarine trenches and, and little hills and cliffs and stuff like that. But most of it is actually pretty flat. This is known as the abyssal plain. If you've ever seen that old movie known as the abyss, this is what they, this is where they went to. They went to the abyss, which is just the deep sea. Okay, so that's what they're talking about when they talk about the abyss, is just deep, deep sea. So the abyssal plain is kind of the flat area that's just way out away from land in the middle of the ocean. Now, as we go towards land, each land, you know, is a continent, right? When you get to land, you're approaching some kind of continent or island. And this is exactly what happens. You start to have a buildup of the sediment, right? And this is known as the continental rise. Okay, the continental rise is the beginning of the continent. So everything from here over is considered the continent. Anything from here out is going to be considered open ocean, pelagic, the abyss. All these words are kind of interchangeable when you're talking about this deep area out here. So moving closer to land from the ocean, we go from the abyssal plain where there's nothing, nothing but open ocean, but not nothing. Then we start to hit the continental rise. This is that first part of the slope where we actually start to go up, up, up. Then we reach the big slope part that's known as the continental slope. Okay, that's actually the sloping part. So this continental rise is just the beginning of that steady upwards. That steady upward is known as the continental shelf. Okay, sorry, continental slope. <laughs> continental slope is the steady upright. Now, it's going to hit a point where it actually kind of levels off for a minute. It's still going up, but it's not going up nearly as slopey or as fast as it would way out here. This is known as the continental shelf. Okay, so outside of our continent, there's this kind of shallow, slowly sloping area before it drops off. Okay, that drop off is a continental slope, but that slow area where we're building and building and building and building, that's known as the continental shelf. And I can tell you the continental shelf is very important when it comes to marine organisms because the bulk of marine organisms are going to be found over the continental shelf, which means all of this open ocean out here, not a whole lot going on. Of course, there's life. Of course, there's organisms all throughout. But the bulk of life and the diversity of life is all occurring just here, just over the continental shelf. Now, we're going to talk about why that is later on in the semester. Really, it's the availability of things like sunlight. So the primary producers, the base level of the food chain, they need sunlight. You're not going to find sunlight way down here and therefore 
right? You're not going to get that base productivity, which everything else depends on, which is why you're not going to get the diversity that we you would if you were just talking about right here of a continent shelf, where it's relatively shallow compared to the rest of the ocean. So do you need to know all these things? Yes. Would I be able to identify and maybe label this diagram? Yes. Could it be on a test? Absolutely. Make sure you pay attention to this picture. But with that said, let's continue on from this one to the rest of our talk on seawater part two. Now let's talk about circulation. Hopefully you guys know that the ocean is not stagnant, not a big stagnant body of water, but it's constantly moving. In fact, it's constantly moving in actually a pretty predictable pattern. And this is known as circulation, and it is in a circle. These circles are known as gyres, okay? And they're caused by several different things. One, it's the rotation of the earth. Two, it's the wind. The wind is created by things like the sun, right? So it's a, it's a whole different factors on why these things are actually happening and why they're actually turning in a specific way. But these circulations include things like gyres or these rotating, circulating, um, basically just patterns, right? Gyres, just random circulation of the water. Also, we get fluctuations and circulations based on the tides. Now, the winds might be caused by the sun, but the tides are caused by the moon. So all of these different environmental factors, like celestial factors, like the sun and the moon, actually have a huge part to play in our oceans and therefore in our ocean circulating water. And that's where it's really important to learn about this kind of stuff because this is the environment that all these marine organisms are living in. So we really need to understand everything about the environment. Now, we already talked about how winds are uh, driven by sun energy, which we're going to talk about. Um, yeah, okay. Well, let's just move on and talk about them then. So what happens is on a hot sunny day, the sun is beating down, right? That earth actually gets heated up. So when you heat up the earth, right, the air right above that earth is also going to get heated up, right? It's going to get warmed by that sun. When you heat anything, heat rises. So in this case, you've heated up the air. That air is going to begin to rise. As it rises up, it kind of creates a vacuum, like you're sucking it up, which means you're going to suck in the air from the uh, from basically the latter, you know, the lateral sides to replace the air that you just shot up into the atmosphere. So as the earth gets hot, it shoots the air upwards, creating a suction goes and up. That's what actually creates the winds. So the winds usually are at the hottest place, right, where the where the air is going straight up. You can get those little breezes. But really, the winds are going to be on either side. OK, so the winds are created because it's sucking up the air up here. Okay, so from the side, you're going to create those winds. And that's how things like the easters, easterly, the westerlies, those trade winds that people used to sail on and be navigating the globe with no power except wind power, they did this because of things like those trade winds. Those trade winds can be predicted because of this pattern here, which I always thought was so cool. All right, so the sunlight heats up the air, the air rises, the cooler air rushes in to fill in that space. That's actually the source of the winds. Um, when we look at the equator, and that's what we're going to look at right here, we can see right at the equator, we have lots of clouds, and that's because we have lots of heat. Okay, and this is actually going to heat up that the water, it's going to heat up the air, it's going to heat up everything, and it's going to shoot that wind, sorry, it's going to shoot that air upwards. As it shoots that air upwards, wind will rush in to replace that missing air. So if you look at the equator, you don't actually have a ton of wind, but if you look just north and just south of the equator, that's what you get, those easterly and those westerly winds, those trade winds that are actually really predictable, strong and constant, which is great if you're trying, if you're a sailor and you're trying to get any, you know, all over the world, it's going to be a lot more uh, efficient if you actually have wind to fill your sails with. So this is how we got things like the easterly and the westerly trade winds. Now, this wind direction also has an effect on the surface currents. In fact, it has a 45 degree deflection based on the direction of the wind. So if I have my wind direction is blowing this way, the way the water is going to move is actually in a 45 degree angle going this way. Now, why this is is a question for your oceanography teacher because this is marine biology. So I'm just going to teach you that it is instead of going into why because of the rotation and the turning and the... Don't worry about it. Just know that the surface current right, of the water is always going to go at a 45 degree angle from the direction of the wind. Okay, and I'm never going to make you calculate it or draw it or anything like that. But just, you know, easy test question, 45 degrees. 
Now, this 45 degree deflection actually is kind of important because uh, the winds are going to be going in certain directions on certain latitudes, and that means so are the surface currents. And so what we can see right here is we can actually see these northeast trade winds, these southeast trade winds, the westerlies, the, um, we can't see the easterlies, the easterlies are way up here and down below, but it's basically the direction that the wind is going. And this, again, has to do with the rotation of the Earth, but mainly it has to do with the winds. So the winds are kind of creating these almost gyre patterns themselves, which are kind of creating this spinning, rotating motion of these winds. Now, I'm not going to ask you to draw this again, but this is, this is the reason that we actually have such circulation on our planet, is because of these winds creating that 45 degree deflection, creating certain patterns in certain areas that actually mixes the ocean pretty well. Well... I wouldn't say pretty well. It mixes the ocean, not always the best, because again, some parts are very, very cold and some parts are warm, and those never really get mixed because they're gyres. They kind of get stuck in their own little circle, and therefore nothing really gets out of it. In fact, fun fact, the Bermuda Triangle is a gyre. It's literally a gyre, so when they're like, both can't get out of it because there's something mysterious going on, they got stuck in a gyre. They got stuck in a little rotating circle and the winds weren't strong enough to blow them out. Now, that's not the only thing that's going on with the Bermuda Triangle, but that, that's a big thing because it is its own gyre, which I think always thought was super cool. Now, let's talk about waves. So, we talked about wind. We talked about it affecting the water, but how so in waves, right? So, if there's a lot of wind, you're going to get stronger and higher and bigger waves. Less wind, you're going to get less waves. Not only does it affect the strength of the wind, does it affect the size of the waves, but how far that wind has been blowing. So this is known as fetch and not like mean girls, it's so fetch. No, like fetch, like it's literally the distance that the waves have been moving pushed by the wind. So if your fetch is larger, meaning you're lo you've, you've had a longer distance, oops, where's my clicker? If you've had a longer distance for your wind to be blowing the water, those waves are gonna get larger. You're adding more energy to each one of those waves and they're gonna build up and they're gonna build up and they're gonna build up and they're gonna build up. So if your fetch or your distance in between that the waves have been blowing, or the fetch is the amount of open water that the waves, the wind has been blowing, therefore building up the waves, if your fetch is larger, then your waves are going to be larger. So what happens is the wind pushes the waves, it creates these little tiny ripples, little tiny ripples. You know, maybe they're stronger in some areas. Um, you know, this is where you can get those, if you've ever looked out on the ocean, it's like those white caps, you see those like white, that's this right here, that's big strong winds pushing the waves over, actually creating a little crust, that little white surf, you know, breakage. But usually what happens is the wind kind of pushes, 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 and then what gets created is swell. So swells are not waves, but they're what comes, what makes a wave. So the swell is the rolling of the ocean, but what's going to happen as it gets closer to land... That energy has nowhere to go. And as the water gets deeper, sorry, shallower and shallower and shallower, that energy is going to build up. And it's like, I don't know where to go. I don't know where to go. I have all this energy that was created over here. And I'm just traveling, traveling. And so what happens is once you actually get this drag down here, and that's essentially what it is, the water on top is moving faster than the water down below. And that's why your wave topples over. Because it's going out here and it's kind of dragging along the bottom. And then it gets shallower and shallower, and that's why you get the actual crashing of the waves. So if you've ever gone to the beach, and you've been in the ocean, which you probably have, and you've been hit by a wave, which you probably have, right? It's all because of the wind and the drag right here of the surface, which is pretty cool. So when I talked about the crest of the wave kind of crashing over, that's essentially exactly what it is. It is the tallest part, or this top part right here is known as the crest. Right? The bottom part right here is known as a trough. If you're talking about a wavelength, you are literally talking about crest to crest or trough to trough. Really does not matter, right? But you want to go one hole up and one hole down, right? That is one complete wave, okay? So if we'd say crest to crest or trough to trough does not matter. It's the exact same distance, right? And that's why we usually do the swell at a... If you're talking about the swell or the waves, you usually talk about them in intervals. So this would be like a 15 second wavelength interval. And that's how much time it takes to get one full wavelength rotation through, um, through what you're talking about. Um, okay. Oh, the wave period is the amount of time that it takes. Okay, it's a wave period is, again, how long it lasts. That would be that 15 seconds. 
we talked about this already, how, again, the top of the wave keeps moving, keeps moving, keeps moving, but then it gets hit and starts to create drag, so the top's moving faster than the bottom, hence the topple over, hence the actual crashing of the waves. And that's exactly what happens. It gets dragged by the bottom, and that force causes it to crash over, and again, that's why you get those really killer, you know, tubes that people um, surf, and I don't know, I'm not a surfer, I'm a diver, and therefore I hate waves. Because I'm constantly getting crashed by on by these waves, which sucks, but it's still fun. Um, so, because you know you're getting crashed on by these waves, including myself, not a lot of organisms can actually live in this wave action area, and that's because you're constantly getting moved around. You're getting disturbed. Sand's getting kicked up. Waves are hitting you back and forth. Um, it's a really kind of nasty area, so you have to be very highly specialized if you do want to survive in these areas. And most organisms just can't, and therefore they don't even try. But the organisms that do live here are actually pretty well adapted to it. I mean, right below the surf, there's usually these little surf perch, and they're really good swimmers, and they're highly maneuverable, and they just, like, spend their entire life drifting back and forth like this, but they're okay with it. So as long as you're adapted to it, then you're totally fine, because no, they don't have a ton of predators. Almost nothing else can live there. So they save themselves from the predators by living in kind of this, like, harsh wave action area. Let's talk about currents. Right? We talked about currents a little bit, but um, let's go into a little bit more details. Remember, currents are coming from the wind, so it's very important to remember. Uh, there are surface currents and deep water currents, and so they're not always going the same way, and they're not always, definitely not always going the same strength. So usually deep water currents are cold, and they're slow, and it's the dense water, and it's just kind of slowly drifting. And the surface currents are usually getting pushed by something like the winds, and therefore are moving at a, at a greater rate. Um, so you can have opposite moving currents. You can have both of them moving the same way, but one moving much faster than the other. Um, all created by these winds, and usually it depends on the density of the water, the, what the lower currents are doing. And that's why they're separated, because the warmer, less dense waters are going to move at a different rate than the colder, slower, more dense waters. Um, let's see, the Coriolis effect is kind of a big deal. So in the northern hemisphere, all of our gyres go clockwise. In the southern hemisphere, all the gyres go counterclockwise. This is actually kind of a big deal when it comes to the ecosystem. And you're like, what do you mean my ecosystem here is dependent by the ocean? Yeah, especially being here in Southern California, a lot of our temperatures are based on the ocean. Remember how we talked about the ocean can absorb a lot of heat or let out heat? That maintains our temperatures and therefore regulates our ecosystems, which is really cool. So if you look at our waters on the California coast, right, and you're talking about, if you're looking at a globe, and I'm sorry, I don't have one here, um, but if you're looking at a globe or a map, you would see that, you know, if we were going clockwise in the northern hemisphere, our waters would always be coming from the Arctic, which is why California is actually pretty cold. If you were to go straight across to, like, Japan, their waters are super warm and it's very humid and hot out there, and you're like, wait, we're at the same latitude. It's because we're getting our waters from Alaska where they're getting their waters from the equator. Okay, so it goes from Alaska to California to the equator to Japan and back. Yeah, so that's actually what moderates our temperatures here in Southern California, which is crazy because if we lived in Japan in the same latitude, it would be super hot and humid. But it's not. It's actually temperate out here and uh, fairly nice, especially right now. Okay. We did talk about the Northern Hemisphere, everything's going clockwise. In the Southern Hemisphere, everything is going counterclockwise. That is the Coriolis effect, based on the winds and the spinning of the ocean. Sorry, the spinning of the ocean. Those are gyres. The spinning of the Earth. So literally, planet Earth, right, plus the winds are going to those, those constant winds that are always going in that same direction. It doesn't change. That's what's actually going to push the water. So the um, right above the equator, those trade winds, it's going to push down towards the equator, which is going to push down. It hits the equator. Excuse me. It's a natural barrier. It doesn't usually go below. So then it's going to deflect back off and go back up. Then it's going to hit those westerlies, which are pointing west, which is going to shoot them all the way over here, which again is going to get pushed here and then pushed here and then pushed here. Hence the gyres. It's all based on the winds and the rotation of the planet, which is pretty cool. Let's look at that. We keep talking about gyres. What do we mean by gyre? This is what I mean by gyre. These are all individual little gyres. Okay? So you can see right here, this is the one I was talking about. We get our cold, slow-moving waters from Alaska, which moves down into California, 
which moves down to the north equatorial, equatorial current, which gets heated up, because remember the equator's nice and hot, gets heated up, shoots it over to Kirishio. That basically is a nice warm current because it's coming from the equator, which shoots it back up to Alaska, but brrr, Alaska's cold and therefore it cools down, which then shoots it back over to California, which then back over to the equator, and then that's what we get, a gyre. If we look at the exact, so this is what's called the North Pacific gyre. This would be the South Pacific gyre because it's in the South Pacific. It goes the other way. So now we're going counterclockwise, Coriolis effect. And we're going the south equatorial current, which is going to be nice and warm because it's right near the equator. And then it's going to take it down off the southern tip of New Zealand right here towards the Arctic where it's very, very cold. And then it's going to bring those cold waters up to Peru. So you think, oh, South America is really warm, not off Peru and Chile and all that because you're getting, again, these cold, cold Arctic, Antarctic waters. Then it's going to shoot it over here and it's going to go back to the equator where it's going to get nice and warmed up again to shoot right back out here. So that is that gyre. Right? These are not all the gyres in the world, but these are some major gyres. Hopefully you can kind of see the pattern on what's going on here in, these, uh, in this example. All right, we talked about deep sea currents with a deep, cold, density, rich water, like high density, right, thicker water, versus the light, warmer, less dense water that's on the top. This is known as an ocean layer, right? Lighter on top, uh, warmer water, colder, denser on the bottom. So this layering actually causes several different, you know, phenomenons to happen. One of which is we don't get a lot of mixing way down low, right? The mixing is all going to happen on the surface, right? That's that warm, relatively warmer surface waters. It's less dense. That's going to get mixed up by the winds, mixed up by storms and stuff like that. As you move farther down, you're, you're going to get a little mixing, right? There's still water movement happening. Those are those deep sea currents, right? So you're going to get some mixing. But as you get way down, that water is basically still. There's no wind that's going to penetrate all the way down to the bottom of the ocean. So really, you're just relying on kind of organisms moving around you, or maybe a real slow current. But that's not going to do a lot of mixing, right? So we don't have a ton of mixing going on way down below. Um, uh, so the biggest thing, remember we learned about thermoclines? is when we are working our way down at a certain point, remember that chart that we saw? It goes warm, 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 cold, right? That's the thermocline, that drop right there. Well, at a, a certain point, it's just, it's just uniformly cold. So the thermocline is really happening in this intermediate la layer, and that's it. As soon as you get below that, you get to the bottom layer, it's just cold. It's just cold, it's just dark, not a ton of oxygen, no light, um, and very, very, you know, very little mixing going on here. Now, mixing is still very, very important, so you're like, well, why do we need to mix? Well, um, if you've ever been to like a nasty stagnant pond that doesn't have any mixing, kind of smells gross, that's because, you know, usually things want oxygen. If you don't want oxygen, you're probably some kind of anaerobic bacteria that doesn't like oxygen. You're going to pump out things like methane, right? That's sticky methane, which we don't want. Not only that, but if you need oxygen and you live on the bottom of the ocean, where's that oxygen coming from? The surface which means you're going to need to mix up that water to get that oxygen from the top all the way to the bottom. Um, we learned a little bit about nutrients and salinities. Remember, things are floating in the water, but eventually they will settle down to the bottom. Well, if you need nutrients and they're all sitting on the bottom, but you live at the top, you're like, what, well, I need those nutrients. Okay, so mixing is very, very important. And there's two different types of mixing that we're going to be talking about. Now, if we're talking about downwelling, downwelling is really important because it's moving water down. Okay, so in this case, we have an onshore wind, which is going to push the water towards the shore. Once it hits the shore, it has nowhere to go, so it's going to turn back and go down. This is a good thing because it's going to bring this warm surface water, which has lots of oxygen and dissolved gases. It's going to bring those down to the cold, denser water, where they're normally, that thermocline prevents mixing. The warm water is never going to go into the, the lower cold water. It's going to sit right on top. With downwelling, we actually force that warm water down into the colder le level, which brings, again, those really important ox uh, um, gases, like oxygen, nitrogen, all sorts of gases like that. It's going to actually bring that down. So downwelling, really important to bring gases down to the bottom. The opposite of that is going to be upwelling, and upwelling brings things up. 
These are those nutrients and stuff that fell down to the bottom that nobody has access to anymore, right? Because you all live up here. So this is actually going to be an offshore wind that's blowing off shore, and it's going to push the water away from the shore, which is then going to create this vacuum. It's going to suck it up, 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 and then it has nowhere to go, so it's going to turn and go along the surface. So it's bringing cold, nutrient-rich water towards the surface. So now all these organisms get another chance at food, excuse me, plants get another chance at um, nutrients for the photosynthesis that they need to do. So it's very, very important. So both upwelling and downwelling are good things, and they're bringing different things depending on what direction you're going to. So know the difference between those two. Uh, let's talk a little bit, well, getting back to tides and circulation. So circulation is also driven by tides. It's a really important thing. We need to circulate our ocean and tides help us do that. Tides are created by the moon. So our moon cycle is uh, what going to be affecting our oceans, tides. Um, and really this is just a gravitational pull on the moon. So let me show you this real quick. I don't know if I have a picture of this coming up. I don't think I do. So I'm gonna draw it for you guys. Okay, so say we have Earth and the moon and the sun. Okay? So that's my earth, that's my moon, and that's my sun. When they're all lined up, what happens is they actually have a gravitational pull towards the sun. Okay, so when they're lined up, both of the gravitational pulls kind of work together. Sorry, this is terrible drawing. I'm doing this backwards on my camera. Okay, so it increases the gravitational pull. So when they are lined up, and this usually happens during full moons or new moons, remember, the full moon is when you can see it, and the new moon is when it's behind, you can't see it. Okay, so full moons or new moons, you're going to have the highest tides. The highest high tides, the lowest low tides. Because that gravitational pull is really pulling on that water, which is going to cause it to go back and forth way more than it would normally. Now, when it is normal, and I can't even say normal because both of these things happen throughout the month. Okay. Say we're in like a half moon, so this is Earth and the moon's over here, right? It's not in the same alignment. So in this case, the Earth is going to have a gravitational pull, but the moon's also going to have its own gravitational pull. So in this case, they're going in different directions, which means the pull towards the sun is not going to be nearly as much as it would be if they were lined up like here. So full moons, new moons, high, high, high tides, low, low, low tides. What's, uh, these are called spring tides. And these are called neap tides. High, high highs, low, low lows, medium tides, basically, these, these neap tides. So the spring tides like spring forward and spring backwards. The neap tides are kind of like, man, I'm just going to roll in and roll out. So they're not as high, not as low. And these, again, both happen several times a month. So um, there is no normal. Uh, OK. So why do we care? Why do we care about tides? Well, we learned a little bit about when we talked about broadcast spawning and concepts of biology that a lot of those guys are going to do it based on the tides or the moon or certain phases of currents and stuff like that. So for them, it's very important for reproduction. Otherwise, if you're maybe one of these guys who live in the intertidal, it's also kind of important because if you're a marine organism, you need to be in the ocean. And if the tide goes out and you're stuck on a rock and you're no longer in the, in the ocean, you have some things that you have to worry about. And we're going to talk all about that when we get to ecosystems and the kelp forest. I'm oh, sorry, the intertidals. Um, but it's a really nasty, harsh environment. Say one day you're covered by water and the water is 60 degrees. And the next a few hours, the tide goes out and now it's 100 degrees outside. You go through a 40 degree temperature flux in the matter of hours. That'll kill most organisms. But these intertidal organisms are actually really good at sustaining those, um, those drastic temperature changes. So... Uh, not only is it important for reproduction, but again, like we talked about in the surf, a lot of organisms can't live in those areas. So if you can, you're already at an advantage because you you have less predators because not everybody else can survive there like you can. Uh, all right. So again, getting back to tides a little bit, there are different kinds of tides. We talked about spring tides and neap tides, but inside of those, we have daily tides. So like I said, it happens in a day. Okay, so sometimes you can have what's called a diurnal tide. A diurnal just means one day. So you would have one high and one low tide in that day period. Now, if you have a semi-diurnal, that means you have two high tides and two low tides. 
this is all based on usually the seasons of the month and all this kind of stuff because again the rotation of the earth and how far away the sun is okay so sometimes you're gonna have two high tides and two low tides in a 24-hour period now usually if you're talking about a semi diurnal the high tides and the low tides are about the same about exactly the same maybe they vary just a little bit but only just a little bit they're pretty much the same now if you have a mixed semi diurnal tide that means you have two high tides and two low tides but they're of different heights so maybe your first high tide isn't that high but your second high tide is much higher or your first low tide is really low but your second low tide is only kind of low so that would be a mixed semi diurnal tide so diurnal just once a day semi diurnal twice a day mixed semi diurnal twice a day but of different values um, we already talked about how the sun and the moon both affect the tides. This is very important. Um, we talked about spring tides versus neap tides. So this is, again, just the definitions that I just showed you. And here's a better drawing. I, I, I got ahead of myself. So again, when the moon is in line with the sun and the earth, we have the gravitational pull that is in line, and therefore you're going to have a spring tide. When it is like a 90 degree angle, right, out of the way, it's going to kind of spread out that gravitational pull, so it's not going to be as high. And it's not going to be able to have the high, high tides. So this would be your neap tides. So like quarter moons are going to be neap tides, whereas full and new moons are going to be spring tides. And again, we're back in line with the sun. So we've got nice, strong gravitational pull for a spring time. And then now we're on the other side right here. We've rotated around. And now we're on this side, which means this is going to be another neap tide. All right. So the last thing we're going to talk about is depth. So we talked about depth and going down into the ocean, but there's lots of different things that happen when you go down. One of them is you lose some spectrum of light. So when you see a rainbow, right, a normal spectrum of light, you see red, green, blue, yellow, orange, all those different colors. But when you're in the ocean, most of those light spectrums actually get absorbed. In fact, red is the worst one. Red is the first one that disappears. So after about 30 feet, red is gone. You don't see red anymore. I... <laughs> forgot this fact when I was buying my scuba gear and I bought a bright red tank thinking like oh you'll totally be able to see it as soon as you go down to 30 feet that tank looks black and you're like really I now have a black tank on yeah it's totally crazy so red gets absorbed the least blue gets absorbed the uh, um sorry red gets absorbed first or the most and blue gets absorbed the least or it takes the longest to, to absorb so blue can actually go down to like like 250 feet almost so at 250 feet you can't look around and just see blue everything just looks blue I once went to 150 feet when I was in Cuba it was like 154 feet and I'm looking around and I'm like I know that sponge is yellow but it really looks blue like it's crazy because you really you don't see that and again color is just all just reflected light when that light is absorbed it doesn't reflect and therefore if you go down in the ocean pretty much everything looks blue right red first gone blue last gone you don't need to know the order of the rest of them, just which ones are first and which ones um, are last. Now, with depth also comes pressure. Hopefully, you guys know this. Remember, if you dive down to the bottom of your pool, you're like, oh, that kind of hurts. That's pressure. And that's because those oxygen molecules, all those gas molecules that you have in your body are getting squeezed and compressed, and that's why you feel that pressure. All you have to do is give a little equalize, and then now you're equalized to that pressure. But really what's happening is all those gases are getting shrunk. Okay, so if you were to take a big balloon, this guy has a big old balloon in his boat, and he drops down to 30 feet, about 30 feet, that's one atmospheric pressure. Okay, that's a lot of pressure. So that balloon is going to shrink significantly. In fact, every 33 feet is another atmospheric pressure. Okay, so usually when you go up in a plane, you're at a couple thousand feet, and maybe you're only at like two or three atmospheric pressures. Every 30 feet in the ocean, you're at another atmospheric pressure, another atmospheric pressure. So the pressure in the water is way higher than the pressure ever is in the air. So you're essentially having this big balloon on the top of the surface, and as you go down, like if you were to go all the way down to, say, 260 feet, that balloon would be deflated. And it's not that the gas got away. It's not that that oxygen left. It's just so condensed, it doesn't even look like it's there. And I've done this. I've done this with a water bottle. You take a water bottle... You fill it up, you go down, even 60 feet, 70 feet, that water bottle is smashed. You bring that same water bottle right back up, and as you get shallower and shallower and shallower, you can see it, it returns to its original state, which is crazy. It's just those oxygen molecules, those, I say oxygen, but I mean gases. All those gas molecules have been shoved really close together, and they're already really small. So that volume is decreased, but as you come back to the surface, 
that increase in the volume comes right back and it goes right back to its original size, like this guy right here. So it's crazy. So remember, every 33 feet is one atmospheric pressure. That's what you can see right here, one ATM. So crazy, crazy stuff, guys. Um, and I have been there. The pressure is intense. Sometimes you have a problem equalizing and you're like, oh my God, I feel like my head's going to explode. And then all of a sudden it goes, and you're, like, and you're like, oh, okay, I feel fine. <laughs> uh, but this is also how divers get things like the bends, right? You get bent if you come up too fast, which means those, those molecules, those gas molecules in your system have expanded way too quickly. You can get skin lesions. You can get huge bumps and what look like boils. You can have molecules of oxygen go into your brain and your bloodstream and then blow up and cause aneurysms. It's really nasty stuff. That's why when they train you to dive, they train you not to go up too fast. Really, you should never go up faster than your bubbles go up. So the bubbles are naturally just going up and up and up and up and up, and they get bigger as they go up. Same thing inside your body. You just want to go up nice and slow to make sure that those gases can expand at a normal rate and don't cause really nasty problems like the bends. So if you're, di if you're a diver, and I know I have a lot of diver students, just be careful because you don't want to get bent. It's nasty. <gasps> And that's it. That is our chapter. Well, that is our second half of seawater. So yes, we covered a lot of things today. Yes, I talked a little bit fast. Go back and rewatch this video, guys. There's a lot of information in here. And yes, you need to take notes on everything. Don't just look at the PowerPoints and be like, I got it. Make sure that you really do understand this. So I would take notes off not only my lecture, but the, the PowerPoint as well. And really, you should be going, you should be following along with the PowerPoint um, as I'm lecturing and clicking on each one of these slides. So you can see them in better detail than just on my TV monitor. Anyway, thank you so much. How do oceans say goodbye? They wave. Because we learned about waves, right? Terrible dad joke. But with that, I will leave you guys. Thanks so much again for sticking with me. And I will see you guys next week for our next lecture on uh, marine ecology. Oh, that's going to be a fun one. I love marine ecology. You guys are going to love it too.